Welcome to Installation 00 and this, the most detailed video series. In these videos, I analyse technology from the Halo universe to a level of detail not found anywhere else in the galaxy. In this most detailed breakdown, we will analyse Mjolnir Mark IV armour, the first major breakthrough in powered exoskeleton technology, the predecessor to the Mark V armour of which we have already analysed. If you want to see that, we will link it in the description and here in the video. The Mark IV entered service on November 27th, 2525 and was the most significant breakthrough in powered exoskeleton systems ever seen. These advancements set the Mark IV apart from its spiritual predecessors in that it was the first armour system deemed streamlined enough to actually resemble a suit of armour rather than a larger mechanised unit that had significant operational limitations to wide-scale application. This enabled the platform to outperform all other examples of powered exoskeleton armour systems that had thus far been created. Project Mjolnir was and still is developed in tandem with the Spartan program. The Mark IV, V, VI, VII and most of their constituent variants were conceived and developed by Dr. Catherine Halsey and the Special Warfare Centre in Seongnam in the nation of Korea, with some variants being developed by separate military and corporate entities which we'll identify as and when we analyse them. These outsourced armour components and platforms were specially designed for more specific Spartan operations and thus deserve their own analysis. It is worth noting here that work began on the Mark IV in 2511, meaning it was in a state of continued research and development for nearly 14 years before it entered service in 2525. Up to this point there were various versions of the suit in development as a testbed for multiple different breakthrough technologies. In 2531 the earlier suits were given, or replaced by, a generational upgrade to more effectively combat the threat of the Covenant. Only in 2535 was the Mark IV actually given the generational title of Mark IV. By this time Mjolnir had become the most expensive item ever produced by the UNSC and was intended to be a continuous pioneering effort to shatter technological barriers. Each suit costed approximately as much as a UNSC destroyer, a vessel measuring 500 metres in length and near 2 million metric tonnes. As such, the commission overseeing Mjolnir's development demanded a simplified generational system to be implemented that categorised and prioritised development more neatly into fiscal year budgets. This gave birth to the Mark system, and thus the naming of the Mark IV. With this in mind, the particular variant we'll be looking at will be the true Mark IV 2535 final production model, as all previous versions are considered as various levels of prototypes. As with our other Mjolnir analysis videos, we will work from the outermost components inwards, analysing every layer and component as we go. As with the entire Mjolnir range, its most recognisable feature is the muscular olive drab armour plating. The large muscular plating of the Mark IV covers the chest, arms, hips, legs, calves, feet and hands, and is made of a highly resistant titanium alloy. The Mark IV implemented a very limited crystalline heat resistive coating on the outer surface of the armour plates to help with dissipation of heat from directed energy weapons used by the Covenant. Due to the optical and thermal mechanical properties of this material, the plasma from Covenant weapons is distributed over a much larger surface area, leading to the heat being dispersed much faster, and thus minimising on the localised heating of the plates. But this still has its limitations and was prone to failure under sustained or particularly large energy projectiles. The system wasn't improved sufficiently until the Mark V was entered into service. The primary titanium the UNSC uses is mined from Planet Reach. It is known that this particular permutation of titanium is Titanium-50, a stable isotope of titanium with 22 protons and 28 neutrons, totaling 50 subatomic particles. This is then alloyed with 4% aluminium, 2.5% vanadium and 1.5% iron which reduces the amount of vanadium needed as a beta stabiliser. This is known as grade 38 which has good cold workability and higher atomic density leading to superior ductility which enables the plating to locally deform when struck by high velocity projectiles rather than cracking completely. The entire alloy is then molecularly strengthened to attain a condition known as single crystal superalloy. In most alloys, the microcrystalline structure tends to be arranged as islands of ordered atomic matrices all meshed together into a disordered face matrix. This results in a grain boundary between the different orientations of ordered metal crystals within the alloy, and these boundaries result in areas of weakness in the material that high heat and stress can exploit and result in critical degradation of the plate's structural integrity. A single crystal superalloy has all of the atomic structures of the material in an ordered phase and orientation equating to a single crystal throughout the entire material. This means there are no grain boundaries and no weaknesses to be exploited. 
The plating is completely impenetrable to small arms fire and can take several glancing blows from armor piercing rounds without failing due to the plating being multi-layered with several layers of armor plates sandwiched together to create each plate. The coloration of the plates can be customized but the standard issue comes in an olive drab green with some of the plates around the joints being matte black to blend with a titanium nanocomposite bodysuit. The plating of the armor is designed to be structurally limited in its motion. This means that plates near joints are designed to hit each other to prevent the risk of hyperextension, which could result in serious injury of the wearer. Some of the plates had very small and powerful magnetic weapon and ammo holsters, as well as an array of sensors for additional situational awareness and systems input, including but not limited to absolute pressure sensors, temperature sensors, air quality sensors, motion detector featuring a quantum mirror for ultra-fine tracking resolution, ultra-clear audio microphone array and auxiliary loudspeaker systems for close proximity conversation, air intake and exhaust ports, electronic compass, altimeter, accelerometer and a built-in torch. The component parts of the armor plating are assembled from up to a dozen smaller constituent armor components all locked together into a larger component piece. The main armor plating is fastened to the underlying substructure track via custom tooled tamper proof bolts that can only be removed by specialist tools. The substructure track is a mechanically weight bearing titanium support structure that is specially hinged and joined to ensure uninhibited movement and is within the titanium nanocomposite bodysuit. This is why the green armor plating looks to be floating on top of the under armor suit, when in truth, they are simply bolted to the substructure track, meaning the wearer does not feel the weight and keeps the plating in their desired location. The main armor plating on the body is broken down as follows. The boots consist of 15mm thick soles which are secured by a foot covering hinge locking bolt and are the foundation of the substructure track, connecting directly to it and thus channeling weight into the floor. The boot also contains strong electromagnets, allowing a Spartan to connect to the hull of a ship in zero-g, and a type of boot tread called Gecko Grip, which is a biomimetically designed traction system, allowing sure footing on even the most slick of surfaces. The leg armour consists of two major plating sections, covering the lower and upper leg, with a third piece protecting the knees. The lower leg contains reinforced piezoelectric bladders which secure the ankles and lower legs to prevent impact injury from high elevation jumps and again joins to the track leading up the legs. Waist plating contains ammunition utility pouches and is bolted to the lower abdomen plate which in turn connects to the track for the upper torso bending. The forearm armour is the same with locking pieces to prevent over rotation and the lower portion is attached to the handguard. The range of motion is adequate for firearm use in hand-to-hand -hand combat, however the guard prevents hyperextension of the wrist. The elbow armour was hinged to fit flush when the wearer's arms were straight, making hyperextension impossible without force adequate to destroy the plating. The pauldrons are mounted at a downwards diagonal angle at the upper edge of the shoulder, independently of the armour below them. This allows the lower arm piece to slide and rotate beneath them, and when the arms are raised, the angled pauldrons move with them. These are all independently connected to the substructure tracks of the arms, connecting in turn to the torso tracking. The titanium chest and back plating provides maximum ballistics protection, are more angular, and are joined via a hinge system on both the central brace and the shoulder connectors, allowing them to rise and fall with the user's motions. The backpack unit of the Mark IV contained a technological innovation that none of its spiritual predecessors had the benefit of utilising. Previous prototype versions of the Mark IV contained a compact fission reactor of the fast breeder variety. It was very small and produced almost unlimited power with no need to be tethered to generators, as was the case with the Mark IV's predecessors. However, due to the delicacy and radioactive nature of the fission reactor, its use was limited until it was replaced with a microfusion plant in the final production model of 2535. The mini nuclear fusion reactor was an innovation unseen in previous Mjolnir versions. Atoms of deuterium isotopes of hydrogen are fused together under extremely high pressures via very powerful electromagnetic fields. The result is a helium-3 nucleus and the release of huge amounts of energy in the form of highly charged particles. These are converted into usable electricity via a process called electrostatic direct energy conversion. The fusion reaction occurs within a small reactor chamber within a highly charged plasma medium. A selective leakage port on the reactor chamber opens, and by means of magnetics and electrostatics, the ions and electrons in the plasma medium selectively leak from the reactor chamber and are directed into an expansion chamber. Here, the plasma medium containing the highly charged particles is guided and expanded in volume, 
by a fan-shaped electromagnetic field that reduces the power density and converts the rotational energy of the reactor chamber to directional energy, suitable for energy conversion. The electrons are separated from the plasma stream and collected on a 22-stage electron collector grid of varying potentials based on the variance in high and low energy electrons. This forms the negative terminal of the power source of the direct energy converter. Next, the ions are decelerated by retarding electric fields, kinetic energy is thereby converted to potential energy, and finally, the decelerated ions are collected on a high voltage electrode that form the positive terminal of the power source of the direct energy converter. This method of converting raw nuclear fusion energy to usable electricity can be considered a particle accelerator in reverse. The high energy particles in the chamber are decelerated to low enough speeds to be effectively and above all efficiently manipulated and converted. This highly compact and linear system plays well to the tight size requirements of the Mark IV, and indeed various Mjolnir generations to come. The entire fusion reactor occupies a volume of 48 inches cubed, or a packet size only 12 inches by 2 inches by 2 inches, half the size of the standard fusion packs carried by marines, yet able to produce continuous power for 15 years of usage before maintenance and replacement are needed. The reactors are encased in a specially hardened casing so as to be as protected as possible from breach or damage. Each unit is completely sealed, electromagnetically shielded and radiation proof. As a failsafe, there is a system that can be implemented to self-destruct the suit to keep the technological advancements it contains from enemy hands. A serial code is input and the system overcharges the fusion pack. The result is the incineration of anything within 10 meters followed by a detonation that completely destroys the suit, its occupant and anything nearby, guaranteeing that nothing is left for the enemy to use or salvage. Integrated directly into the fusion reactor is a power supply control unit responsible for distribution of power to the suit's functions based on where it is needed and when. These two together cut the umbilical, so to speak, of Mjolnir and gave it unequaled potential as a weapon of war. Next we come to the matte black titanium nanocomposite bodysuit. This component is made of a nanoscale titanium alloy composite. The outer surface is treated with a carbon reinforced carbon heat resistive coating as the suit is particularly good at dissipating heat from directed energy weapons. It is highly flexible but very strong, adding additional protection for ballistic and energy based weapons. The gloves feature sensors that detect the weapon being held and displays the relevant information about the weapon to the suit's situational awareness systems. It is a simplistic system as most UNSC issue weapons, and indeed civilian issue weapons, have electronic components to display ammunition capacity. So the suit simply detects this information directly from the weapon's internal electronics. For Covenant weaponry, the suit effectively detects the physical profile, weight among other things, and compares them to a database of known weaponry, and once a match is found, the suit displays the information. For unknown weapon systems, the suit usually doesn't display any information at all. The titanium in this layer of the suit acts highly efficiently as a Faraday cage, making the inner layers of the suit completely impenetrable by electromagnetic fields and electromagnetic pulses. The bodysuit also has numerous structural hardpoints located across its surface that all link to an internal substructure tracking. These are designed to be the main connection interface between the heavy outer plating and the more soft, flexible bodysuit. The plates are bolted onto these via custom tool tamper-proof bolts and some by tongue and groove connections. These structural hardpoints redirect the weight of the armour plates through an internal titanium substructure meaning the wearer doesn't feel the weight of the suit, a wise decision given the total weight of the suit is a thousand pounds or half a metric ton. The titanium nanocomposite bodysuit is the last visible outer layer of Mjolnir Mark IV, as all the following components are protected under the soft armour of this suit and the hard armour plates. At the innermost surface of this suit is the pressure seal. This component is a resistive composite that is entirely airtight and waterproof. It is treated with a coating of nanoparticulate synthetic copolymer specifically designed to be superhydrophobic, vacuum proof and radiation proof to alpha and beta waves and resistant to gamma waves. This component allows a pressurized and breathable atmosphere to be maintained at all times, down to a zero ambient pressure and up to an extreme ambient pressure. The pressure seal is very powerful and from incidents involving overpressurizing of the hydrostatic gel layer and low orbital insertions we can calculate the seal to have an estimated breach strength of around 12,000 psi of internal pressure. The suit also houses a large quantity of internal computation systems including the Mark IV BIOS which is the firmware written to initially boot up the suit systems, identifying, testing and initializing them as needed, and updates to the BIOS allow new hardware to be supported. This is the last outwardly visible layer of Mark IV, so we will now go over the internal components as and when we come across them.
The next system we find is the reactive metal liquid crystal layer. This layer is composed of a polymerized lithium niobacene, a material originally used to diffuse the static electricity buildup in the ship's hull during faster than light slip space travel. It is a piezoelectric material, meaning that when it's mechanically deformed it creates an electric charge, a reaction which also works in reverse. When electrical charge is applied, it mechanically deforms in shape. The material is amorphous, meaning it doesn't appear to have a crystalline structure and thus flows like a liquid. However, upon electroactivation, a crystalline structure is induced, giving it the properties of a solid. It is poured into a microcapillary system throughout the suit, where high accuracy and strength microelectric fields can induce crystallization geometry process and cause the deformation along the desired axis. So when the user sends the neurological signal for voluntary movement to their skeletal muscles, the suit interprets the signal and sends the relevant electrical signal to the capillary system surrounding the desired muscle groups. The material mechanically deforms and creates movement. It frantically scales and amplifies user strength, giving the user around double their unarmored strength and increases reaction time by a factor of 5. It is noteworthy to mention that the system cannot be scaled back or limited in any way, so only Spartans with their augmented physiology are able to harness the power of this system. The next layer we come across is the hydrostatic gel layer. The hydrostatic gel is a hydrogelatin or a water-based gel. It is blue in colour and serves the purpose of regulating temperature as well as conforming to the wearer's body for a better fit with Mjolnir. It can also be pressurised to protect the wearer from high g-forces, large impacts and zero ambient pressure. The gel automatically adjusts its pressure based on what the sensor rays tell the suit, but can also be manually overridden and overpressurized to protect the wearer, although it runs a risk of inducing a nitrogen embolism. In the event that the suit takes on excessive heat, for example sustained or high energy plasma fire, Mjolnir has an exhaust port built into the suit that releases the gel, preventing the occupant from being burned or boiled alive. Sustained damage to the suit can cause the gel to become viscous, rendering it either partially or completely ineffective. The hydrostatic gel layer also features an armor lock system where the gel's density is altered to completely seize up the entire system into a rigid posture. Doing so prevents muscle and joint injury from high impact, rendering the suit and the wearer completely stationary. The inner skin suit is a skin-tight compression layer covering all of the body including feet, toes, hands, fingers and head up to the face line. It is a moisture wicking layer designed to draw sweat away from the body and is also filled with temperature sensors that link to the hydrostatic gel layer for temperature regulation. It also features wireless direct bone conduction earphones to allow communications gear inside the helmet to link directly to the earphones. The suit also features water recycling systems for urine purification enabling the user to function for longer periods of time in environments with low water supply. Embedded into this layer are various automatic biofoam injector ports. Biofoam is an elastic protein wound filler foam. It is an expandable sterile spray with a local anesthesia clotting agent and antibacterial, antifungal and antiviral properties. If the wearer becomes injured, the biofoam can be injected from the ports visible on the outer surface of the armour. These will channel the foam to the site of the injury and fill the wound with biofoam, sealing the wound, stemming the bleeding and giving some pain relief. The biofoam doesn't heal the user as such and these serious injuries will still require medical attention. Made of the same titanium as the outer plating, the helmet contains a full heads-up display built into the gold reflective polarised visor. The visor in question is made of an extremely resilient, specially tempered composite cell multi-laminated sapphire glass. This makes the glass extremely hard, very resistant to scratches and shattering. This is then treated with a polarisation on the outer surface which renders the virus its characteristic gold mirrored finish, and a coherent light molecular display on the inner surface enabling the heads-up display functionality. The heads-up display is capable of displaying mission-critical and situational awareness data. A visual display from the motion sensors is visible with yellow blips showing as friendly units, white as neutral units and red as foes. The system inside also detects the weapon being held and displays a targeted reticle matched to the angle and trajectory of the barrel of the weapon, and thus the rounds to be fired. It gives a visual image of the weapon being held and its current ammunition capacity, all being fed from the weapon in question or calculated by the system itself. The visor comes with a built-in zoom function, effectively magnifying the light coming through the visor and re-displaying it in a zoomed aspect ratio. It also features a smart scope system able to link wirelessly with weapons with scopes and display the scope view in a full face display, particularly good for long range shooting accuracy. The system also detects any holstered weapons or grenades and can display waypoints, objectives and place markers above friendly units' heads, target units 
and a visual compass is also visible by default. Many additional pieces of information can be displayed ad hoc based on the needs of the time. The Spartan can also access a systems menu where various diagnostic tools, features and rosters can be accessed. The helmet has an ultra clear microphone array and speaker array built into the helmet to allow the user to hear outside of the suit sealed systems as well as communicate both out loud and over radio communications. The helmet also makes the physical connection between the Spartan neural interface and the suit enabling the full speed and power of the suit to be harnessed, although, even when the helmet is removed, the user can still move and function, but at greatly reduced speed and efficiency. While we're on the subject, the Spartan Neural Interface is an upgrade of the neural interface all UNSC personnel are given at Listman. It is implanted via a complex surgical procedure, and once implanted, the interface directly accesses the IFF friend or foe tags that come as standard and directly links the brain to Mjolnir's systems, allowing thought to be translated into motion seamlessly. Since the suit circuits interface directly to the brain, they increase the reaction time of the user by effectively bypassing the body. In Spartans, post augmentation, estimated nerve conduction velocity increases to around 240 to 360 meters per second, meaning thought to motion happens in approximately 7 milliseconds, a 300% increase in reaction time. Mjolnir systems take the impulse created by the brain from within the brain, convert it to a digital signal, and send it to the suit's movement systems. Since digital signals travel through the suit circuits at 280 million meters per second, thought happens to motion so fast it is nearly impossible to chart. Since the systems translate thought to motion faster than the host nerve conduction velocity, the wearer has to take a long time to get used to the effect, as the user voluntarily sends the signal to move the suit, but the suit moves the user before the user's signals have taken effect. This reaction is so fast that only Spartans with their altered neural physics and enhanced physiology are able to handle such an increase. The link between the neural interface and the suit really comes into its own in regards to the helmet, as all of the functions of the helmet's internal systems are accessible and usable via the neural interface. The user simply thinks about what they want to do and the system recognises it and adjusts accordingly. No need for a secondary interface to control the helmet systems, just think of it and the system does it. For example, if the user squints, the suit interprets this as needing to zoom and displays a zoomed aspect ratio. When the user thinks of a member on their team, the suit automatically opens a private communications line to them. The helmet also contains air filtration systems. The air intake is on the left side of the helmet's mouth guard. The air is pulled in and filtered through a high efficiency particulate arrestant or HEPA class 20 filter, a high efficiency gas absorption or HEGA filter, and an ultra low penetration air filter or ULPA, altogether capable of filtering 100% of particulates, toxins, pathogens, and molecules from the air. The air is pumped into the helmet just left of the mouth, and the exhaled air is sucked out of the exhaust vent just right of the mouth, passing through yet more filters to the external exhaust vent on the right of the mouth guard. In the event the suit enters a vacuum or underwater, the vents automatically seal and a rebreather unit activates for up to 45 minutes of breathable air. The helmet also houses a torch, mission camera, as well as connection hardpoints for various additional systems to directly connect to the helmet. The helmet also makes the final connection in the pressure seal and is fully supported by the suit so the user doesn't feel the weight of the helmet. and the helmet gives the finishing touch to the suit's large, muscular and dominating appearance. The Mark IV made innovations breakthroughs that were utterly unheard of in any previous attempts of powered exoskeleton systems, and that have been the foundation to all further developments achieved ever since. It played a pivotal role in the early days of the Human Covenant War, and has even been adapted to the new Gen 2 platform, meaning it is likely we will still see Spartan IVs in a modern and upgraded version of this impressive legacy armour set. Thanks for sticking with me. If you have any suggestions on anything within the Halo universe that you'd like to see given the most detailed treatment, stick them in the comments down below and I'll get to them as soon as I can. As I'm sure you understand, the level of detail that I insist on getting down to here is of an intensity that it can take a while to fully flesh out the more complicated constructs. That being said, something I really enjoy, and I hope you have too. If you want to see more stuff like this, click the subscribe button and hit the like button as it really helps push forward the collective knowledge of the Halo universe. If you've made it to the end of this video, you're evidently pretty fanatical about the Halo universe, in which case, click the little bell icon, that way next time I put a video out, you'll be notified the second it hits the shelves. If you feel like helping the channel out, and ensuring that I can keep you well informed on the innermost work into the Halo technology, consider popping over to Patreon, and jumping on board with Installation 00 as a patron. Take care guys, and go rest your brain.